Hey, it's Allison Law with the Literary Atlanta podcast. Happy holidays to you. I'm recording this episode after Christmas and before the New Year's. Uh, my husband, Zach, and I are home in Atlanta after a long weekend with my family in Tennessee, and we're shortly going to be heading back to Tennessee to spend some time with his family. We're really fortunate that we have so many family members and friends within driving distance and that we have some time over the holidays to be together with them. I know it's been a while since you last heard from me. You know, the format of Literary Atlanta has always included a brief personal interlude or a book business story from me. That's followed by an intro to the author, guest, the interview, and then a list of author events happening in the metro Atlanta area. I researched and listened to a lot of other podcasts before deciding that I liked hearing the host personal stories, as well as jumping into the newsier interviews or details about the books and the writers. If you listened to the long form panel episode that we did way back in the early literary Atlanta days back in 2017, then you'll recall that this is a common thread in many long form pieces now. The journalist is part of the story or it is a feature of stories now, uh, more subjective information, which is a drastic shift from the days when I was a journalist back in the 90s when we were taught that nobody cares about the storyteller, we need to be as objective as possible and leave it to the audience to draw their own conclusions. But when I was researching other podcasts to start this one, one of my favorite podcasts is a show called Terrible Thanks for Asking. And the host is a woman named Nora McInerney. She lost her father and her first husband, Aaron, to cancer within a short period of time. And she went on to found several nonprofit organizations and to write a memoir about her experience. And then she um, started this podcast. And in each episode of Terrible Thanks for Asking, or TTFA, um, she dedicates most of the show to someone else's survivor stories and tales of coping with grief, grief, um, talks about human resilience, and it's bookended by Nora's own personal experiences. And since I'm asking the writers that I interview to tell me their personal backstories or to explain how their own personal experiences inspire or infuse their work, I want to honor that by sharing a little Christmas letter or 2018 recap with you here. And this will be a standalone episode, no author interview. I'm not going to go over any author events. Everything's kind of quiet on the book front here uh, since it is the end of the year. And since also to this needs to be a standalone episode, otherwise it would be really awkward and unfair to the guest to talk about my own personal stuff and then transition to, hey, here's the book you should read, completely unrelated to um, everything else that I just said. So standalone episode. 2018 was a tough year for me professionally. After a nonstop period of projects and business growth and launching the Literary Atlanta podcast in 2017, everything came to a screeching halt, probably in September 2017, and it's never really picked back up. I've been in business as an independent writer, publicist, marketing consultant, Jill of all trades for 10 years now, almost 11, and I've never experienced this type of slowdown. I have numerous, numerous, <laughs> numerous conspiracy theories about what happened or um, why all of this has happened, but um, I'm not going to, I'll save that for maybe for future episodes, but it's been challenging uh, financially, psychologically. Um, I'm not saying that I didn't have any work. Uh, it's just that... It was one of those times, maybe you can relate to this, where I have just been hustling in so many different directions. I have pushed on and pushed on and tried so many different potential projects, and um, very few of them have come to fruition. And it has caused me to rethink exactly what I do for a living. As a matter of fact, I... Um, decided after, so if this all kind of started in early September 2017, it was almost a year later when I was talking to some friends of mine and I said, you know what, I'm, 
I'm tempted just to go and get a, get a teaching job. And um, my friend was like, well, we still need some part-time instructors and um, maybe this is the time for you to finally try adjunct teaching. So I was like, oh, sure. Um, maybe I'll give teaching a try and see if that's where my next career path is going to take me. And after one semester of teaching two 1100 level, entry level English courses, I'm 100% sure that teaching is not for me. I believe now that every adult, especially childless by choice adults like myself should have to spend some time volunteering in their schools or teaching our children. This was a life-changing experience for me and I'm not ready to repeat it anytime soon. I'm still, the semester ended at the beginning of December and I'm still trying to figure out how I want to proceed, but I, I have a lot of I learned so much and I have such a new respect, not that I didn't before, but I just didn't know, you know, I, you don't know until you're doing it, um, how hard it is to, to be a teacher. I was just a part-time teacher and I, it totally consumed my life and, and all of my friends who teach, um, who were so helpful to me and who were so encouraging and said, it's okay, it's not, you're not as bad as you think you are. I'm, I'm pretty sure I was. Um, but they all told me it's, it's worse the first time you do it because you start from scratch. You don't have the syllabus. You don't know the material. And so it, it really was one of the hardest things I've ever done. I'm so glad that I did it. And I'm still trying to figure out what that experience will ultimately mean to me. Um, but I'm not teaching next semester. Um, <laughs> and on top of everything else, um, we found out that Zach's job is disappearing. Um, we thought that was going to happen December 31st. Um, first of all, he's been with a, the same company for three and a half, almost four years, and he's been a, a contractor this whole time, and they've always been dangling this carrot, you know, like, eventually we keep asking for the additional headcount, we just can't make it happen now, and so finally this was the year that they had to do it, and they, they told them that it was, it was definitely going to happen, and then I guess in October his boss called, because she lives in Arizona, and said, you know, not only are we not making you a full-time employee, but we're ending your contract. So um, that has made things a little bit um, interesting, I guess, too. So we're both going through a little bit of soul searching in terms of the career moves. Um, you know, perhaps I could have recovered a bit faster from all of this job turmoil if things in my personal life hadn't also been a bit tumultuous. Last fall, I lost two members of my family within a couple of months of each other. These were complicated men who struggled with various addictions. They distanced themselves from the people they loved the most. And then they ultimately succumbed to not taking care of their health. And while I was not close to either of these people at the time of their deaths, I grieved for who they were to me and my family and who they would never be. Their passing solidified for me that life is determined not just by the extraordinary things, the big milestones and life-changing events. It's really an accumulation of the tiniest daily choices that we make. They gather around us like little grains of sand and only make themselves known when we're about knee deep and like, how did this happen? And... So what, what their passing ultimately meant to me was that after a lifetime of struggling with my weight and watching, you know, a few minor health problems start creeping into more permanent, debilitating territory, um, thyroid problems, asthma, um, arthritis, the arthur, um, I opted to have weight loss surgery last January. 
And that is hard for me to even say sometimes uh, because it wasn't an easy decision for me. It's an option that people had been recommending to me for years, and I refused to even look into it because surgery is always a risk. And honestly, I felt like I was a failure if I couldn't lose the weight without medical intervention. And, you know, I I, um, also said, and this is true, that if my head wasn't in the right place, then it didn't matter what happened to me physically uh, through surgery or otherwise. And my biggest fear, which remains a, a real fear, is that I would have the surgery, I'd lose the weight, and revert back to my old habits and regain the weight. Many times when you tell someone that you've had weight loss surgery, they proceed to tell you that they know someone who had the surgery and put all the weight back on. Nothing is more terrifying (laughs) than having someone tell you that because it's plausible. It's possible. The surgery doesn't mean that all my weight and health struggles are behind me. As of this recording, I've lost 99 pounds. 99. That's right. It's not 100. I can't say. I've lost more than 100 pounds. Um, I'd like to lose a little more weight, but you know, my body may be done. I've been holding at this weight for a little while now, and um, it's been almost a year since I had my surgery. It was January 2018. I'm still learning and adjusting to all of the changes that come with having what Zach calls my magical science stomach. And uh, as I, you know, have told many people that I've shared the story with over the year that, uh, you know, it is hard to get your mind to adapt to what all is happening in your with your body. And so that's been something else that I've been a little bit preoccupied with. But the good news is that that was a good decision. It was a decision that I made to take better care of myself. And I'm so thankful that I had the opportunity to pursue that and to um, recover from from those things. So, you know, all of it kind of balances out. It just, it just isn't the way that I would like it to happen. I want everything to happen on my, um, my timetable. And um, I'm not known for my boundless patience. When I want something done, I want it to happen immediately. And um, guess what? People don't uh, don't always comply with that. So, so there's that. Um, let's see what else. What else happened in 2018? <laughs> uh, let's talk about Literary Atlanta. I was hoping to find a media outlet that would adopt the podcast and share it with new and more listeners. And quite frankly a media home that would provide me with the resources to do all the many tasks that I've been doing solo for the last year. At the very least, I would love to hire a professional editor producer who could help me produce the best quality show and make sure that it gets out every week. Uh, It's hard when you do all of those, play all of those different roles yourself, and you're trying to find a job and you're recovering from surgery and, um, so it, it's just it's just been a lot. And um, as things were kind of up in the air with um, my consulting business, I thought, well, maybe I need to move back to the journalism side of things. Maybe I need to, to write and do reviews and um, leave the whole publicity piece that's not been very satisfying for me. And um, go back to my writing, tend to my own writing, because when I started this eight years ago, working with authors and publishing industry professionals, I mean, part of that was because I wanted to write my own books. I wanted to go back to my journalism roots. So, so at some point, it looked like I had a potential partner who would help me produce and publish the Literary Atlanta podcast. So I would drop these hints with you like, hey, I've got some special news coming. And then nothing, right? So um, so I had two potential um, websites, media partners, and, and neither of them uh, have come to fruition. In the meantime, I've had the most incredible year in terms of 
the people that I've been able to interview and the people I've been able to meet and all of these terrific live author interview events that I've been doing, um, that I've done at the beginning, we were doing all of the interviews in the studio or in person, um, but mostly in the studio or via Skype. And in the past year, um, I've had the opportunity to do a lot of these live author interviews events like Writers at the Wrecking Bar, um, hosted by Acapella Books, um, at Beyond Books. Remember, we started that program at the Wren's Nest in 2018. It was a monthly author interview series. Um, In November, there was one week in November where I had four four separate events. One of them was with two authors, so that was two books. Then another one was with three authors on one book, and then another was one author on one. So it was just like the craziest week. November was just action-packed, but it's been so amazing. That was, um, I got to go to the Jewish Book Festival, which was so incredible. Pam Morton does a wonderful job there. And I have four live author interview events that are already scheduled, two in January, two in February. And I'm so embarrassed because I have a lot of interviews that are already, as they say in the biz, in the can. They are already recorded because I've been recording all of these author events and so and have, have continued to do also the, the Skype or phone interviews. So I have all of this content that I'm dying to share with you. So I just have to I just have to get it all together. And so I promise that I'm looking for a way to bring all of this to you because I really do want to continue doing the podcast. It's just become this thing that's bigger than me. And um, that's really cool. Thank you so much for that. That's really cool. Um, That's really cool. So um, yeah, that was kind of a long-winded 2018 recap. I haven't even gotten into... I was trying to explain all of this to Zach, like, what should I talk about? Uh, what should I share? And it was seemed like all of those things were just these big things that you needed to unpack for days. And um, but that's that's kind of the the highlights too. Um, huh? What's been going on with you? <laughs> what's your story? Um, I, as I said, we're getting ready to head to Tennessee. We're getting ready to start 2019. I'm so excited about all of the possibilities. And, uh, oh, I guess I buried the lead because here's the other great side effect of all of this is that I have read so many books. I, um, I try to read at least one book a week, but because we've had such a steady volume of of events and interviews that we've done over the past year. I set my Goodreads goal at 52, so 52 books for the year, um, one book a week. And I'm at 80 something, like 81 or 82 books for the year. And I don't think that I've been able to go in and and do all of the books. And that doesn't include all of the books that I've read and abandoned because I'm not going to put that information out there. Who, who, who needs that, right? Um, so... Oh my goodness, there were so many good books this year. Uh, So many incredible people that I got to meet. And um, so many of you who got to meet at events, and um, including my new friend Ken from Kentucky. I met you at the Decatur Book Festival, and I was supposed to mention you in an episode. So, Um, Melly's friend from Kentucky. It was very nice to meet you at the Decatur Book Festival. Um, And yeah, there's a lot of good things that are happening. So I want to make sure we end on a positive note because I feel like I've been whining the whole time to you. But um, it's been been a good year. And next year is going to be even better. And in the meantime, I'm going to get back to all of those interviews that I've been recording and share them with you because they're really great. And I wish you so many good things for 2019. Please tune in. We will be back. And um, thanks for listening. Take care. Stay lit curious.